Welcome everybody on this Monday afternoon to our punch needle class. My name's Darren. Or my name's no, I'm not Darren. I'm Claire. <laughs> it's a Monday. Can you all tell? <laughs> my name is Claire, and I'll be helping in the chat, answering any questions there, or forwarding them on to Darren, who is your teacher there on screen. He's showing off some of the projects he's made with this technique, looking very seasonal with his jack-o-lantern there. I'll also put the handout in the chat in case you need that again. And just another reminder that the recording for this will be available on about 24 hours on the Michaels YouTube channel. And now that all of that is out of the way, we'll let Darren take over. All right, welcome to class. So this is, um, I've been working on this class for a while and I've been practicing, I started this technique the first time I ever saw it or even learned, heard about it was at um, the Dutchess County Sheep and Wool Festival in upstate New York about three or four years ago. I didn't even know this was a thing, but um, it is a thing. And people have been making crafts with this technique for hundreds of years. I don't know a lot about the history of it, but it, it did take place in colonial times in America. And Frequently, they would, instead of using a needle to punch through the fabric like we're going to do today, they had a hook. And often it was just like a bent nail that they would use to pull the fabric through the opposite direction to create the same type of look that we're going to create today. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we, as we get going. Um, also, instead of yarn, we're using yarn today, but people um, historically would use strips of fabric. And they wouldn't just like go to the fabric store and buy fabric and cut it into strips, they would reuse fabric that had already been used many times and basically was not good for much else at that point. So they would take old clothing or old rags or old blankets that couldn't be used for much, much um, else and cut them into strips and use that instead of yarn because it was all about reusing and repurposing everything. So they didn't want to waste anything at all. But for our purposes today, we're going to be using yarn and we're going to be using um, this technique, which uses this um, needle punch tool. There are lots of different kinds of these tools, but this is the one I have today from Lion Brand. Um, I do wanna talk a little bit about, excuse me, about um, the frames that you can use before we get started. So I have, oh, sorry, let's go back. I have this, um, this one set up to get started in an embroidery hoop. Um, you can, this is just a normal hoop, but you can buy a non-stick, I'm sorry, a, a, a gripping hook, one that has a, a non-slip hook that has a groove inside of it. And when you snap it together, that groove kind of snaps in and it holds the fabric in place very, very securely. So investing in a non-slip hoop might be something you wanna think about as you practice a little bit, because if the fabric doesn't stay very, very tight, then it will um, get, it'll get looser and then your loops become unsteady and you have to um, keep cooling it tight. And sometimes that can affect the way that your piece will turn out. So you do wanna try to keep it as tight as possible. Another option is um, there's this one, which, it has um, like, it's almost like a wire brush, but the bristles are all facing out. So they're all facing away from the center and you put your fabric on, on here and stretch it. And um, these, they're really sharp. I've cut myself on these, but um, they hold it into place. And this is really the best option, but this is quite an investment. I think this one was given to me, but I think it was close to 50 or $60, but um, if you're going to become more serious in, in this craft, then later on you, might, you may want to invest in something like this, which will hold your uh, fabric very, very tight, very, very secure, and you won't have to really um, re-tighten it. The only time you'll have to move it is if you need to move it to, to work on a different piece of your project. So this, this type of a frame is very nice. And then I got kind of crazy because I was having so much fun, and I ordered this great big frame because I thought I would probably wanna make like big rugs or big wall hangings. And this is the same, the same tech um, type of thing where it has these very sharp um, kind of like a wire brush or 
um, carpet tax, I think they call it, where um, it really, and you just wrap your fabric around it and pull it very tight, and then it, it holds it in place. So this one, I think I bought one that's too big. May have been nicer to have a smaller one, um, maybe half this size, but sometimes we kind of get over excited and just start buying stuff in the middle of the night when we should be sleeping. So cautionary tale. Um, another thing you have options with are the fabric you're gonna use. Um, on this one, I have some burlap. This is just regular uh, burlap that I bought at a craft store and it's pretty cheap. I think this was $7 a yard, but I, I think that was a lot for it. I think you can get it for $4 a yard. So that, that works pretty well. I haven't done a lot with the burlap. I've practiced a little bit with it. Um, this one is what I've used most. And if you look at this, you can see there are white lines that are spaced out in this fabric. That's what you want. You wanna see those white lines. And even though it's a really loose weave, you can, you can see it's pretty loose. Um, it's, it's not super loose and the fabric holds its shape nicely. And this is called monk's cloth. And so this is what you want when you go buy it at the store, you wanna look for these white lines that are spaced out. I think they're supposed to be every two inches or so. This, however, is also called monk's cloth. And you can see it's a much looser weave and the lines, it doesn't really hold its shape as well. You can see it's much looser and much more flimsy. And this is also called monk's cloth, but this will not work. And if you go into a craft store, I went into a very nice craft store here in Brooklyn where they have a lot, they teach classes on this. They have all kinds of stuff. And I told them I needed um, monk's cloth for needle punch. And this is what they sold me. And I have practiced and I've tried for several, um, several attempts and I couldn't get it to work. The, the loops just pull right out. So um, just know that if you go to a store and tell them you want uh, monk's cloth for needle punch, they, they might not know the difference of the correct kind and you'll end up buying the wrong kind and have to go back and buy the right kind. So just look for this, uh, make sure you get the kinds with the white stripe in it. So, all right, so all that being said, let's go ahead and switch to the view of my hand. And, okay, any questions about any of that though? before we get started, because I know that's kind of like a lot of information right up front. Oh, I cut myself on that stupid frames. You do have to be very, very careful with the frames because you will, you can cut yourself. And if you're like me, you will cut yourself. Okay. So when, when you decide you're going to do a project, so um, for our purposes today, I thought we'd start off with something very simple like this little heart. And you wanna make sure that you're giving yourself plenty of room to work in your frame, in your hoop, but then you also wanna leave yourself um, extra space along the edge. And this fabric will unravel very easily. So you can see like on this little piece, it wants to unravel very easily. So it's important that you use tape um, to secure your edges. Now, I only had this duct tape today, but I do recommend um, using maybe masking tape or like that blue painter's tape because it'll come off of your fabric a lot easier. This duct tape or like packing, like regular packing tape, when you take it off, it can also pull the strands of, um, of thread out of the fabric and actually cause it to, um, to kind of unravel on, an, on its own that way. So um, best practice would be to use a um, masking tape or that blue painter's tape, all right? And this, I think this little stencil of this heart was included in your pattern, but um, feel free. I mean, honestly, just cut out any shape of a heart that you like and go from there. Now, there are many ways of transferring your design to your monk's cloth. And I'm just going to quickly talk about a few ways. Um, you can, if you have something more complicated uh, than just this heart, what you can do is you can hold your monk's cloth up to a window, like a sunny window. You want to tape, maybe go ahead and tape your um, picture that you're going to be transferring on the window to keep it secure from moving. 
and then hold your monk's cloth up against the window and with a black Sharpie marker, you can just go ahead and trace it. If you have a light box, which I do not have a light box, but if you have a light box, it works the exact same way. Or you can get iron-on transfer pens or pencils and you can um, get the picture that you wanna transfer, uh, go over the entire thing with your iron-on pencil and then put that face down on your monk's cloth and then iron it and it will iron onto your monk's cloth. And then if you need to, you can go over it with a Sharpie marker to fill in any lines. So that's just a few ways that you can transfer it. What I'm going to do today is the, the most simple way. And I just pinned it in place. And then I'm just going to just trans, just uh, trace it with my Sharpie. Very, very simple. And if you kind of mess up like that, you don't have to worry because we're going to cover everything with yarn. And it will all be fine in the end. So does anyone have any questions about how to transfer it? I'm only showing this one way, but um, the other ways are all pretty simple as well. But do you, do you want me to uh, elaborate on any of the other ways of transferring the design? So some of the designs are very complicated. Um, I do have this other one that I included which is slightly more complicated, but still not very complicated. So this is the flower. And so what I would do to, to transfer this one is I would just lay each piece out how I want them to make sure you get them just how exactly how you want them, pin them in place so they don't move, and then trace each one, you know, once you get it set exactly right, and then take that away. And then you can lay these leaves down, these leaves down and then trace behind it. So you can do each piece of the design, each layer of the design separately and kind of trace around each piece. And then that way you can position them exactly the way you want them. You can have all the leaves on one side, you could have them spaced out evenly, you could have some going off the edge. Um, you can really kind of make it your own and um, make it very personal and add um, different things around the edges if you wanted to. So, okay, so that all being said, we've got our cloth, we've got the right kind of cloth, we've got the good hoop, we've got our tape, and we're ready, I think, finally to start with our needle punch. Any questions at all up to this point? How are we doing, Claire? We doing all right? I think we're good. I think we're ready to get to some punching. <laughs> I know that's a lot. It's kind of a lot to talk about in, a, in advance of the punching. So with this Lion Brand punch, um, it comes with a piece of wire, which I very promptly lost, but I made a new one with just a piece of copper wire from my jewelry making supplies. And what you want to do is you want to feed this um, piece of wire starting at the tip. You go through and then you just hook your yarn on the end of the wire and pull it down through. That's how you thread the needle. And then you also have to then thread the eye of the needle. So it's very important that it comes down through and then through the eye of the needle. You want your working yarn, you want your ball of yarn to be coming out the back of your pen. And then um, this, this will be then the working end of the pen. Now with the Lion Brand Punch, it has different settings. So we have A, B, C, and D. And what that does, you can see it makes this uh, the needle either very long or it can go clear up inside when you're not using it. So much shorter or very long. And that will determine how long your loops are gonna be. So you can practice, do a couple of little practice swatches and see how you, know, how you like it. You can do different um, lengths of loops on the same project for, to make different textures, uh, to make it look different, you know, whatever kind of an artistic, um, kind of an artistic mood you're in. You want to just, I like when I do a design, I like to start with the outline first. 
And so I'll go all the way around the outline with this um, out the color I'm going to use. So the colors I'm using today are different than the ones that I originally used. So if you want to make it and look just like this one, then you can use the colors that are listed in the handout. Um, I thought I'd show how it looks just if you use different colors because you can really change it. I'm using Wool Ease Thick and Quick by Lion Brand, and this color is called um, Air Force. I'm using one. This is um, this one is Hometown uh, Bonus Bundle, and this one is uh, San Diego Navy. And then I'm going to also be using um, Wool Ease Thick and Quick in Fisherman. So these are some just other colors. Uh, worsted weight yarn or larger is best. So you can use a worsted weight, a chunky, or a super chunky. Anything larger than a super chunky will probably get jammed up in the pen, but you're welcome to try anything you have to make, um, you know, to see how it works for you. So you want to just go ahead and push that all the way through and you wanna pull your starting end to the front of your work. So this is actually gonna be the back of your work and the other side that we can't see is gonna be the front of your work. So we're always working from the back. Now for something like a heart, which is pretty symmetrical, it doesn't make any difference. But if you're making a design that is um, not symmetrical or if you wanna have letters, like if you wanted to write like, I love you or love or just something on this, you need to make sure that you remember you're working from the reverse side. So you would have to write any writing uh, backwards. And then when you turn it over, it'll be presented in the correct way. So always remember that if you're gonna do any kind of writing, make sure you do your writing in reverse. You can hold it up to a mirror to make sure it looks nice and looks correct. And then when you turn your work over, it will be read in the correct way. Okay, so I'm going to just do a couple of stitches here. Pushing it through. Um, you want to remember, you can see the eye of my needle that the yarn is coming through. I always have behind um, the way I'm moving. So I'm moving up this line creating the outline of the heart, but the eye of the needle is in the back. You always wanna have the eye of the needle facing um, the opposite direction of the way you're moving. And I'll show you why. If you turn it the wrong way and I try to go in, now I'm pushing through my yarn and it's gonna you know, kind of get hung up on that. So you always wanna make sure that the yarn is coming out of that eye of the needle and it is, you're moving away from that eye. <clears throat> you always wanna make sure that you're pushing the needle all the way through, so all the way through. And when you bring it up, you wanna make sure that the needle, the tip of the needle is still kind of dragging against your fabric and then entering the next one. You want it always to be dragging against the fabric. You don't want to do this. You don't want to pull it up like this and then go down because you'll end up with a missed stitch. So if you pull it up like that and then go down, you're not going to get stitches that are correct. Sometimes you'll still be able to take a stitch that way, but your loops are going to end up being different lengths. So you want to make sure you're keeping your, the tip of your needle right there, touching the fabric. And another thing that's extremely important is this um, loose yarn that's coming from your ball of yarn. You wanna make sure that you have plenty of slack pulled out and you wanna have that resting next to you um, so that it can come to you 100% uninhibited. You don't want it, um, almost any pressure or any tension will prevent you from making proper stitches. So 
it should flow completely uninhibited. And if it does end up getting wrapped around like the leg of your chair, or if you rest your arm on it, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold this tight for a second and show you. So, so you can see if it's tight, then you're not, it's not going to be able to, to give you enough yarn to make your stitches and they're just going to keep pulling out. So if you find that your stitches are just pulling out, um, stop and make sure that your yarn supply is not being um, hampered in any way. So it's actually really simple. It's very simple in theory, but it does take quite a bit of practice to get a nice even stitch. So I'm gonna show you the other side and it's probably not super even because I'm kind of demonstrating and talking, but you can see, so this is what it looks like on the other side. And if you have some of these that are really long, um, what you can do later on is you can kind of trim them up to make them a little bit more even later on. Um, this long string that we started with, you can go ahead and just cut that off so it's the same length as the rest, All right? So I'm going to go ahead and restart it again. And so what I should have done, it's nicer if these, this one that was finished, when I cut it, before I cut it, it should have been pushed through to the front. So I'm just going to go ahead and pull that through to the front. You want all of your ends and your beginnings to all be on the front, because then you can cut them even with your other loops and they'll, they'll just fit in there very nicely. If you cut them on the back, what's going to happen is eventually they're going to work their way back through and eventually you'll end up with a long string that you'll just have to cut later on, which is fine. But if you're selling these or giving them as gifts, you don't want like two or three years from now long strings showing up and having people question what's going on with that. So, any questions? Any questions as we're going? So, we do have a couple questions. Um, the first one was, how far apart do you move the needle when you're making the stitches? What was that? I'm sorry, how what? How far apart do you move the needle when you're making the stitches in the fabric? OK, so that is a very good question. And there's not a 100% a answer for that. But we're going to talk a little bit about it. So this little square. I ordered my frame and I'm going to plug this a little bit. I hope it's okay. This, um, the Oxford Company, uh, if you Google on YouTube, Oxford Needle Punch Company, it brings up um, their website and there are all kinds of great videos. The lady that does the videos is incredible. There's hours worth of videos on there, whereas today we only have one hour. She, you know, she goes through all the different things and very, very informative. And I ordered my, um, my large frame from that company and they sent me this little gauge swatch. Now you can make your own. All this is is an, an, um, a square inch. So this is just one inch all the way around. So you could just cut out your own little swatch out of a piece of cardboard. But what you want to aim for is for your outline, you want your outline to be a little bit more dense than usual. So your outline, you should try to have six stitches in an inch. And so here I only have four. So one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So I could try to jam. I should actually try to make it a little bit more dense and have six stitches per inch. Now for your um, the center of, of your design, you want to try to have four stitches per inch. So this would be more appropriate for the center. Um, that all being said, and it all sounds very nice and tidy, but um, this yarn is quite thick. So if I'm using this yarn and getting four stitches per inch, or if I'm using a worsted weight yarn and getting four stitches per inch, it's not going to all equal the same thing. So if you're working with a thinner yarn, you might want to make it a little more dense. And if you're working with a thicker yarn or something that's very firm, you might want to space them out a little bit more. So you want to try to um, you know, just play with your design and see how things are uh, filling in and working together because all the different um, types of supplies are going to 
um, interact a little bit different with each other. Now, I, this brings up a good time for me to talk about this piece that I made, which is pretty cute. I'm gonna say it's pretty cute. I made it pretty quick. I was just trying to get something something put together so I could do a little video for TikTok advertising the class. So I worked this up really fast, but I made a big mistake when I made this. As you can see, it doesn't wanna lay flat. It wants to curl. So what I did was, and I tend to do this, I tend to put way too much, um, way too many stitches together. So this one, even in the body of it, I have like seven stitches per inch where I should only have four. So I almost use twice as much. And I tend to do that. I feel like I need to really fill it in very dense to, to make it better, but that's actually not the case. The case is I'm using too much yarn and I'm causing it to curl and it's not gonna lay flat and it, it's not um, as nice as it should be. But if this were a rug though, um, it's very dense. It's, it would be nice to stand on. So depending on what you're making, maybe what the purpose of it's gonna be, you could you know, make it more dense, but um, really up for the main body of your work, you should try to go for four uh, stitches per inch. So does that answer the question or does that add a whole bunch of new, of new questions? Somewhat of a follow-up question, a two-parter. Um, yes. Does the four stitches or the seven stitches per inch apply to all thicknesses of yarn? No. And no okay. Go ahead. Are there different sizes of punch needles? Like say if you want to use a fingering weight yarn or someone was asking about like a silk embroidery thread, are there skinnier punch needles? I have seen online um, some very, very skinny ones. Um, I haven't used them. I've only used this one and I've used one other one that's a little bigger, but they do come in many different sizes. So if you go online and start searching for sizes, <coughs> excuse me, you can get different sizes for different sizes of yarn. So that's that's gonna be, it's a lot of fun that you can have um, trying out the different sizes if you wanna use different types of yarn. And for the stitch, the stitches per inch, if you're using a very, very thick yarn and you get um, four stitches per inch, it's not gonna be equal to like say using a worsted weight yarn and getting four stitches per inch. So maybe for a worsted weight yarn, you might want to try five stitches per inch or, you know, I, you don't have to, I, I hesitate to spend too much time on this because I don't want people to feel like they have to stop and count their stitches, you know, every few minutes. Um, you just want to try not to um, jam them in too, too densely and you want to make sure that you're having good coverage. So one thing as you're starting your next row, push that through, and I'm gonna pull this um, tail to the front. So you can see I've got a stitch here and a stitch here. You wanna to try to stagger your stitches so that they're kind of um, alternating if possible. Sorry, so, Darren, we had a couple more questions okay. too. Um, someone wanted to know if you could use, and I don't know if I'm saying this correctly, um, Ida cloth, A-I-D-A. -A. Well, you know, I'm not familiar with that, but for whatever cloth you're going to try to use, you want to make sure that it is a loose enough weave that you can push your needle through, but a tight enough weave that it's going to hold the yarn in place. So if you have a yarn, if you have a cloth that you really want to use, I say, you know, go ahead and try it. You know, don't put too much expense in it until you're sure if it's going to work, but go ahead and try it. And if it works, then you're set. Um, I know there are like people use uh, primitive linen, you can use burlap. Uh, there are, there's like rug warping you can buy. There's, there are many types of fabrics that will work. Um, so, you know, go ahead and try it and see. That's the best way to find I've out for sure. got a little clarification from our chat. Um, people are saying that the Ida cloth is for embroidery. So, might not work. Um, and then but we did have a question. 
I might, who knows? Mm -hmm. We did have a question to see how to thread the tip of the needle again as well, if we're gonna okay. change colors at any point. Okay, so I'll go ahead and, so let's go ahead and end it here. So when you end it, it's nice to end it with your tail on the front. And I just kind of pull a bigger loop through than I probably need to and just go ahead and cut it and pull my needle out. And then I've got these tails. I don't, I wouldn't really trim them now. I'd usually wait until I have more done, but, but just because we're lacking on time. And then go ahead and trim off all these tails. But that's part of finishing for later, really. Let's go ahead and change color. Let's use this navy. So I've got my piece of wire. And you just put that piece of wire through your tool and you just got a little loop on the end. Go ahead and just hook that with your yarn and just kind of guide it in so it doesn't get hung up there. Pull it straight through and then remove that. Don't throw it away. Make sure you put it somewhere where you can find it. If you're like me, you'll be looking for it for an hour. Okay. And then we've got this hole right there. You can kind of see it's kind of Shaped like that, and then there's a hole. And all you do is you just take that yarn just right through that hole. So nothing, nothing fancy. You're just bringing the yarn through the hollow needle. And then instead of coming out the end, you're directing it through that hole. And then that's it. Um, when you're leaving this tail for finishing later, you don't need to leave a very long one. Um, you don't want to waste your yarn, but um, as you're learning, you might want to leave a little bit longer just so that it doesn't pull back through by mistake. So, I mean, that's even probably too long. I tend to leave a long tail just because I don't want it to pull back through by mistake. And this yarn isn't expensive. So, but if, you, if you're running out of yarn and you don't have a lot of yarn, then you don't need a very long tail. And then making sure that the tail of the yarn coming out of the needle is facing, it's facing me and I'm gonna move the needle away from me. So this is very important that you're, and then I just tend to pull that tail to the front. Let's go a different direction. Cause when you're going on a diagonal, it kind of changes the way that the um, the cloth is going vertical and horizontal on this weave. And one thing you can do is if you look at these holes, you can count them one, two, three. And if you kind of go in every third one, it might be good, one, two, three, a good way of kind of spacing out your stitches. And Kind of helping you get used to looking at the cloth. So one, two, three. But that would be very tedious though to keep. Sorry. They're calling about my car warranties expired, I think. Okay. okay so let's look at it now. So one, two, three, four, maybe three and a half, maybe four. So by going in every third hole, um, maybe do every third hole and then do every second hole, like do three, three, two, three, three, maybe. And then after you practice for a while doing that, you won't have to count. You'll kind of just get in the habit of spacing them out the right direction. But that's one thing I need more practice with because I tend to really want to use up all the yarn and make it very dense. But when you're going on a diagonal, then the, the spaces are just gonna be spaced out differently because they're not you know, going, um, the measurement's gonna be a little different. 
Any questions about anything else? Where are we? And if you make a mistake, you can rip it out, but it's gonna kind of mess up your fabric just a little bit, but it doesn't really mess it up. If, if it bothers you, you can just kind of, so you can kind of put it back in place if you want to, all right? So. We do have a good question here. Um, if you're filling in the heart, do you work from the perimeter in or do you change directions? And will changing directions affect how the loops look? So when I did my heart, I did the outline and then I just kind of followed it in. I started at the out, outer edge and worked my way into the center. And I felt like that gave it a nice look. And I do feel like it does affect the way that it um, looks from the front. If you if you did it in a spiral, it would probably give it a little bit different texture than if you did um, like up and down. So go, I mean, you can experiment. Different yarns might show up a little bit differently. If you have a really, really fuzzy yarn, it might not show up that texture as much. But if you have a yarn that's much more um, smooth, then you, it might give you a more of a subtle texture in that. So like if you're doing the center of a flower, you might wanna do it in a spiral shape. And then for the petals of the flower, you might wanna do them in lines going up and down. And it might um, help to uh, separate those areas a little bit and give you a little bit more definition. But I think it would be subtle. Anything else? And just to double check, your punch needle came with a threading wire originally, correct? Yes, it came with the threading wire originally that I very promptly lost. So cautionary tale, keep track of it. And so this one that I made, I ended up putting some yarn on the end to make a little tassel. So that way it's much easier to keep track of that way. So a little helpful hint. So when you're lining up your rows, you do want your rows to be kind of just touching each other, kind of just grazing. You can see a little bit of the monk's cloth through it, but you really shouldn't see a lot of the monk's cloth. So you, you want each one of these rows to kind of just be touching or grazing each other. You don't want them overlapping. And let's say, let's say I wanted to do a, a dark blue outside that edge you would not want to do this. You would not want to carry it over and do that. That's not a very good practice, it's, especially if you're making a rug that's going to be on the floor. Eventually that's going to get worn and, and break, and then it could cause your rug to unravel. So you want to make sure that you're not doing anything like that. You would have to cut it and then rejoin and start out there. But the good news is it's very easy to read, you know, you can cut your yarn and rejoin and it's very easy. It's not, it's not a hard thing to do. Okay. So this is pretty much what it is to needle punch. And it just takes, um, it does take quite a bit of practice to get the hang of it. Um, it takes practice to get your loops all the same size. You wanna make sure you're always, the main things you need to always do is you need to make sure you're pushing your needle in all the way. When you bring your needle up to the front again, you want to make sure you're just skipping a few holes, but you're not lifting your needle. You want to make sure that your needle is always kind of grazing the edge of your fabric. Bring it to the front. Always kind of grazing the edge of your fabric. You don't want to lift it. You always wanna make sure you have plenty of slack in your yarn. Um, you, you'll be working along and you'll be having a good time and then all of a sudden your loops will not be staying in and you'll get very frustrated. Um, as soon as that starts to happen, make sure you stop and make sure that your yarn um, is uninhibited. So make sure that it's coming very, don't make sure the cat is not around, Put the you know give the cat a treat and put him in the other room because the cat will go crazy. He'll love playing with your yarn and it will not make your experience better. And always make sure that the yarn that's coming out of the eye of the needle 
is facing in the back and you're moving away from that. So now if I wanted to come back this direction, you can turn your needle and come back this direction. You can see my yarn is facing behind or I find it easier on a small piece to turn my work so that it's coming this direction. So that I, it, I find it easier to, to move it in this direction than try to work backwards. Okay, any, any questions at all about that? We do have a few more questions. Okay. Um, Nikki wanted to know that instead of, you know, going around and sort of following the outline, you could just make random designs inside the center of a heart and then fill in around those later, right? Um, yes, um, absolutely. The best thing about um, this craft and most crafts that I teach is that you can do anything you want. And I encourage you to um, look at what I'm doing and then take it and every direction you can think of and make it very unique and individual. Um, really, you can you could start in the center and work your way out. You could do just random lines anywhere. But um, if if you're going to do I mean, this is a very simple heart. But if you were doing a more complicated design, you would want to make sure that you're doing your outline, um, maybe first to keep it crisp. Um, and then once you get in, you can you know, do whatever you want in here and then kind of bring it up against the outline. So you'll do the outline very crisp and make it um, six stitches per inch. And then whatever you're gonna do in the center, however you wanna do it, um, it'll help make sure that you're keeping this area separate from this area. Because out here, you maybe you'll have another heart, you might have a, a star, you might have something and you wanna make sure that you have good definition. Now, if you don't want good definition on your piece, if you're doing something that's more impressionistic or something that's very um, kind of blurred, I mean, that might be a very fun look as well. You can do anything you want is the answer. But if you wanna have nice, crisp, clean definition, especially if you're writing out words um, or doing a lot of detail work, you might want to, uh, to follow that as a guide. But then after you've practiced a little bit, do anything you want to do. And then a quick question on the tool you made. Um, someone just wanted to know what size wire you used. Oh, you know, I don't even, I can't remember. Um, probably 20 gauge. 20 gauge is very flimsy, right? Like it's not the super fine one, but it's a little, maybe 18 or 20 gauge, I think is what it was. I think so. And then we have a couple questions about um, are there different types of stitches using the punch needle? Like, you know, in knitting, you have the knit and the purl, or in crochet, you have single crochet and double crochet. You know what? That's a really good question. But all the videos I watched and all the research that I did, I didn't see any other stitches. Now I'm really curious to try to find out if there are other ones because I bet, I want to say yes. I want to say I bet there are, but I, Honestly, I didn't, I didn't come across any extra ones. So that could be fun to look into. Well, and I think a lot, probably you can get a lot of variation by changing up the length of the loops on the front, right? Yeah, you can change the length of the loops. You can um, different, this one has adjustable, but other um, needles are stationary and they don't adjust, but you can buy different ones with different lengths. And you can also get different a different look if you use different yarns, different like a fuzzy yarn. Um, you can use lots of different like novelty yarns or unusual yarns, but many of them will not go through the needle punch and the fabric and they don't work well. So if you have an unusual fuzzy yarn or a novelty yarn that you want to try, um, try it on a little swatch first. Like don't plan a whole project around some great novelty yarn before you've tested it, because it, it might not work as well as you want it to, so. And then when you're done, how do you finish off the project? Okay, so let's just pretend that we're done. So I'm gonna push this through. Let's cut 
cut it off on the back. It says my battery on my computer is running low, but it is plugged in. I'm sure it's plugged in. Hopefully it won't go dead. All right. So depending on what you're making will depend on how you're going to finish it. So you're going to go to the side that you're working on, to the front, and you're going to end up with a lot of loops that are in the wrong places. So you want it, this is a very tedious job, but it will really make your work look very nice. So you want to use, I, you can use a knitting needle or a darning needle or something, but you want to kind of go through and sort out all of these loops and kind of push push them into each section that they should be in. And then you see how you can get a nice line. And this is a very important step. Um, you're gonna make something, you're gonna do a design, you're gonna be very careful. And on the back where you're working, it's gonna look very perfect. And when you turn it over, your loops are, you're not gonna have any straight lines and your loops are all gonna be overlapping with each other. And that's normal and there's really, not a lot of what of not much you can do about that um but part of finishing is uh just sorting out the loops and making sure you're putting them where they belong so if you make something and you turn it over and look at it and it looks like a whole big mess just know that's pretty much standard and as you um go through and kind of sort everything out it'll look nice and then you can just kind of go through and trim off Oh, I think Darren's computer died there. And unfortunately, he may have been kicked out here. Looks like it. One second, guys. We will get this fixed. Darren, if you can hear me, you can always turn on the audio on your phone and just continue the class there and forget about the front facing video. Can you guys hear me now? Yes, we can. There you go. I don't know what happened to my computer? It's plugged in. But anyway, so once you um, turn over your work, once you've kind of picked at um, making the line straight and putting the colors where they should be and getting a pretty nice line, then you can go through and trim off any areas that are a little bit longer, just like this. And then you can shake it out, but then you can go over it with a lint roller. Um, you could run a vacuum cleaner over it to kind of clean up any edges. And then if you want to, you can just go ahead and leave this um, in this hoop. So you can turn it over. So now that your front is facing, and you can put it in the hoop. Oops, got it the wrong way. You can put it in the hoop like this. Center it exactly the way you want it. And then cut it, take your scissor and just cut it right along this edge, pulling it very tight. And then you can hang it on the wall and just leave it framed in the hoop. And then that's a very nice way of finishing it. Or you can fold it over and hem it like this. If you wanted to use it as like a doily, you could um, make a large piece and put it in the center of a table. And all you do for this, it's very, very easy. And I'll show you on this one is you just fold, you fold it in half and then bring it up again. And then 
you can pin it in place. And you can do a mitered corner or you can just do, you can just do it like this. You wanna to try to make sure it's not showing from the front. So you can do it like this. So one thing I always like to tell my students is perfection is your enemy. So if you're gonna worry about making everything perfect, then you may as well just give up because everything's not always gonna be perfect. So, but every time you do it, you should try to make it a little bit better. And before you know it, you'll be doing things almost perfect. But there's always a better technique and there's always something new to learn. All right, while you're folding that edge, we have a couple more questions here. Um, say if someone wanted to use this to make like a cushion or a pillow, um, how would you fill in around that heart shape? And then what would your recommendation be for attaching it to another side? Okay, so if you wanted to use just this heart and make it into a pillow, so, let's see. so this is the one that I made, just this circle. So if you wanted to make a circular pillow, um, what you would wanna do is you would wanna, I would finish it like this. I would leave plenty of um, seam allowance around the edge, fold it over twice and sew it down. <clears throat> you could make a square one, you could make it square, rectangle or, or any shape really, circular, any shape. And I would just fill it in with whatever background color you like. And um, you could do different colors in the background, whatever you want. But I had this one staying in the hoop, but I took it out of the hoop for the class so I could use the hoop for the class. So you definitely wouldn't want to cut it this, this close because it's going to really make it very hard to hem. And for something like a pillow that's actually going to be used, you would want to make sure you have a very secure hem because this fabric does unravel very, very easily. So I would definitely recommend for a pillow um, doing this. And then when you when it comes time to sew it, the good news is um, nobody's ever going to see this seam. And so if you're not a great seamstress, you don't have to worry. And I fear that when you're talking about sewing, that scares a lot of people off. So if I can thread this needle. So, and for sewing this down, you just want to, you can um, go under the yarn, but it's best if you pick up some of the cloth and if you are a seamstress, you can go ahead and make this as neat and professional as you need to. But if you're not, you don't have to worry so much about it. You just need to make it secure because you're not gonna see this from the other side because there's so much um, yarn and it's such a thick, see like there's no way you're gonna see that on that side. So you don't have to worry Normally I tell my students to be very careful, space your stitches out all the same and make sure that they're all the same depth. But look, I'm just being crazy and it looks fine from that side. So do not let this intimidate you. But as you can see on this one, I do try to keep my stitches pretty neat when I'm sewing. It's good practice. But again, I don't want people to be intimidated. When you say the word sewing, I think a lot of people just like tune out and they're like, I don't like to sew, so I'm done. But you don't have to see, look, I'm gonna make a crazy big stitch right here. Look, look how awful that looks. But it's gonna hold it in place and you can't tell it from the other side. So don't let this um, hemming like deter you from trying to do it. You could even glue this down. Um, I bet you could use like a double-sided adhesive tape or even hot glue, right? I think, what do you think, Clara? What do you think about hot glue? You probably could, yeah. Just be careful if you're using acrylic yarn that it's not too hot. Okay, that brings up another point. So traditionally, this is done with wool. And 
when you're using 100% wool and you kind of steam block it or if you wet block it, things tend to rub together a little bit and they tend to felt. The, the wool will kind of bloom and swell up and it stays in place a lot better. So for finishing these, this is one of the first ones I did years ago, and you can see I left all this negative space, which you're not supposed to do, but this was, this was I think, the first time I ever tried it. But even with all that negative space this open, on this side, you can't even tell. So, you know, just don't worry too much about your technique. Just practice and have fun. And then each time you do it, you know, you'll do a better and better job. So this one is 100% acrylic yarn, but I did steam it. Um, I put the iron, I put a, a thin piece of cloth and then I put the steam iron on it and I steamed, pressed the whole thing. The iron was probably only on it for like 20 seconds, like steam, 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 done. Um, you don't, you do wanna, it kind of scorches it a little bit and it does singe and it kind of holds, it's gonna help it to hold in place a little better. And it doesn't affect this side at all because it's, again, the, the pile is so deep and so thick, it's not gonna ruin it. But quickly, you know, like, like steam, 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 done. So maybe only like 10 seconds for the whole thing. Um, and then when you look at it, you wanna make sure it does look a little, maybe scorchy a little bit, maybe a little singed, and that's gonna keep it in place. But if you keep it on it a long time, um, it could definitely affect, and you wouldn't wanna do this here. You would only wanna do it from the back. But if you're using wool, then um, it's a much safer uh, prospect. So any other questions? A couple other finishing questions. Um, we did have, let's see, someone wanted to you know if you could use um, like Mod Podge on the back to seal up the loops. Um, so if you're making, depending on, again, depending on what you're making. So if you're making like something like this, um, which is not gonna be used very much, then you don't have to do that. But if you're actually making a rug that's gonna be used, you can get rug adhesive. Um, different types of rug adhesives that you paint the entire back with. Some of them are very, um, like the fumes can be very dangerous. You have to use them in a well-ventilated place. You have to wear a mask. So do some research and be very careful about the ones you select. I'm not sure about um, Mod Podge and how, depending on, again, like if you're just using it as a, uh, like a chair cushion or something to hang on the wall, I think you could use Mod Podge or even like Elmer's glue on the back of it if you wanted to. But again, depending on if it's gonna be in a high traffic area or what the purpose is gonna be, you might wanna research into some more permanent solutions. <coughs> Anything else? And then as far as washing instructions for the finished product. So you would want to think about what kind of um, fibers you use. Like this one is 100% acrylic. So you could wash it much easier than you could say something that was 100% wool because with wool, you do have the risk of it felting together. Um, I would probably, for washing it, I would probably just use a mild soap. And um, you don't wanna scrub it too hard because you could make these to be very fuzzy. Um, I would spot clean it. You might be able to put it in the washer. What do you think, Claire? Do you think you could put this in a washing machine, a small piece? I would probably advise against it. I would just yeah. be worried about something catching and everything getting undone. Yeah, maybe if you put it in a garment bag and did it on delicate, but I would probably just spot clean it or maybe um, like with one of those carpet shampooers. But again, you don't want to, if it's acrylic, you don't want to use steam because the whole thing could melt or singe. So just, just, you know, I don't know if there's a right or wrong answer about washing it. There's not as an easy answer depending on how big the piece is or, I mean, you might want to have it professionally dry cleaned at that point. What do you think? Perhaps, yeah, depending upon the size of the piece and the, the fiber content. Yeah. I would, uh, last question, because I know we are 
just over five o'clock here. And a reminder for anyone who has to duck out that this recording will be available in about 24 hours on the Michaels YouTube channel. And then in about 48 hours on michaels.com slash classes. Uh, but last question, Edie wants to know the flower there. It looks like some of the loops are intact and some of them have been cut. And is that normal? Well, if you are very good at this, you probably wouldn't have to cut your loops. I'm, this is like the third or fourth one I did. And so I'm still kind of fussing over whether my loops should all be exactly the same size. Um, I'm gonna say it's pretty normal, but uh, I, ideally in a perfect world, you wouldn't have to cut your loops. They could all be the same um, without cutting them. But there are different techniques. So on this one that I did, most of these loops, almost all of them are cut. I went into them and cut them. And this is a cut pile. So it's a, cause the, it's a, made the exact same way, but it's a different look. So I'm kind of going through and cutting them all. And this is a cut pile. And this one is more of a loop pile with some of them cut. But one thing I will caution you, especially with a shiny yarn, if you cut a lot of your loops and the yarn is very shiny, the areas that are cut will look quite a bit different than the areas that are not cut because they reflect the light differently. So you might wanna be cautious about that. So anything else? I think that is it for today. Hopefully everyone enjoyed this overview on Needle Punch. I'm gonna put the link to the handout here in the class one, or sorry, link to the handout in the chat one more time. And it should also have been in your class confirmation email in case you need that again. Okay, and I feel I feel like we I kind of rushed through a lot of this because there's so much to cover in an hour. So if anyone has any additional questions, please don't hesitate. You can reach out to me on either Instagram or TikTok. And my screen name there is uh, Mr. M-I-S-T-E-R Woolly Bear. And maybe Claire will put that in the chat. Um, if you want to reach out to me on Facebook, it's just my name spelled out just like normal. And just send me a direct message um, with any kind of questions you have. And I'll be glad to answer the questions and get back to you as soon as I can. I feel like we kind of bulldozed through a lot of this stuff and there's a lot, there's a lot of fun stuff to do with this. So, but we only have an hour. Okay. Thanks Anything for else? joining us. All right, have a good, have a good night. Thanks for coming to class. I'm waving, you can't tell, but bye.